Our guest in studio is CPA Ken Apple. He is the funniest man in accounting. He joins us here on the program. Although accounting can be funny, sometimes it is serious business. Ken, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, John. Good morning, Bill. Great to have you here, sir. We are at uh, March the 27th. April 18 is the deadline day this year, which means we are 22 days away. Thanks for reminding me. You're welcome. I'm sure you probably weren't aware of that in your business. <laughs> I, I just have a few hundred returns to get out before then. So No stress. Yeah. Well, that's like six a day. You can bang Extensions, that out. man. Yeah. Extensions. When, when Ken comes in, I'm reminded of my high school economics class. Ken comes, uh, they teach you to come in with a whole uh, uh, stack of papers and read it, understand, and digest what's here. Absolutely. So I feel the same thing. But what Ken's doing is he doesn't trust us really to ask good questions. So he's giving us the questions that we should ask so it makes us sound intelligent. We've got a term paper right here, baby. <laughs> yeah. and, and I might add, the other thing that Ken's doing is uh, Bonnie Stubblefield's a big fan. Oh, she's very much so, yes. Yeah. She's she, as I. Uh, uh, as I was leaving today, she said, oh, I'm looking forward to listening to Ken Apple. Apparently, Joy Gilstrap uh, is also a Ken Apple disciple. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, it's Shepherd's Cove Development Corporation. Is, you, no matter how you want to slice yeah. it. Yeah, very good. Well, Ken, let's get into it now. If you haven't started your taxes yet, what's advice number one from you? Uh, it's called a Form 4868. That's your extension request. I told you he was the funniest man in the county. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Bill let the cat out of the bag. I mean, I, I, I work hard on these outlines and bring them in to, to make the host look intelligent yeah. when they yes. ask questions. And now he's let everybody know. Yeah. That, and that's done. an enormous but, but, challenge. Yeah, but <laughs> it's, going to, it's probably going to take a lot more than a few pieces of paper for us, us to look intelligent. Bill used to do that, too. And he would come on with Deborah Hammond when he was running the county council there. Our commission at the time, I guess. He'd come in about four or five pages of the question. Rob, at 9.07, ask me this question right here. I'm going to give you an answer until 9.07.45. Then you go to the next one. But he would never do that, Ken. He never would do it. But that was only because he wanted to avoid you asking questions he didn't want you to ask. Oh, that's right. All is fair. All is fair. Yeah. So uh, let's talk, Ken Apple. Sure. Step number one, what are you doing right now if you're a person who's preparing their taxes and they're, they're, uh, they've are they're not yet filed, but they don't need an extension just yet because they think they got a handle on things? Right. So, um, I mean, the, the biggest thing for most individuals is to decide whether they're going to itemize their deductions or not. Uh, so you need to accumulate all of your itemized deductions and compare it to the standard deduction and if the standard deduction is way more than your itemized deductions, which for most people it is, then it makes your task a whole lot easier. Because all, all you really have to report is income. You don't have to worry about deductions anymore. Now, this year we have a, a state uh, passed an income tax cut. Does that affect me for filing West Virginia taxes in April of 23? No. So some of the provisions of the new tax, West Virginia tax bill, uh, go into effect on January 1st of 2023, and other provisions don't go into effect until January 1st of 2024. So your 2022 tax return, which is the one you would be preparing and filing now, was not affected by the tax changes. So, so nothing that I do is affected by that tax cut? I wouldn't say nothing. So if you, if you make estimated tax payments for state... Uh, then you might be able to reduce those estimated tax payments for 2023 compared to 2022 because your across-the-board tax cut was 21 and a quarter percent. All right. Now, you, if you're a W-2 employee, you've been having West Virginia taxes withheld for three months of 2023 at the old rates. And when you file for 2023, you're going to file for the entire year at the new rates. So you could be over-withheld, but... For most of my clients, they're never over withheld for West Virginia taxes anyway. So uh, my recommendation would be to just let that ride and let them change the rates at the next paycheck and keep on going. If you're overpaid a few bucks at the end of the year, you'll get it back. Do you have a thorough understanding at this time as to how the property tax rebate is going to work for automobiles and whatever else? Okay, so you're calling it a property tax rebate. That's not what House Bill 2526 says it is. It is a credit. They went back and forth on that, and I've heard several politicians come back and say that, it, that it's going to be a rebate. And, uh, this feels like a distinction without a difference. No, actually, this no, is a, there's a big difference. Yeah, and this is a question we've asked several times, and we've gotten different answers, mm -hmm. uh, Ken. So I'm glad 
Glad Rob asked the question. I, so. I'm the host. You can count on me to ask responsible, yeah, timely <laughs> questions. I had it, I, That was my question, except you beat me to it. That's so. why I hurried up, because I saw you were just about <laughs> yeah, to yeah. jump off that seat. So, so it is a credit and not a rebate. Correct. Okay. So, so I've come to the conclusion over the years that uh, oh. if I want to know what's in a, a bill that they passed, I read the bill. Uh, because the politicians tell me what's in there, and as we found out with the Senate Bill 424 back in February. With the marriage penalty. They said, everybody said it was in there, it wasn't in there. Uh, the press all reported that it was in there, it wasn't in there. Uh, so I have with me House Bill 2526, the one that passed, both the House and the Senate, the one that the governor signed, and the property tax is a credit on your personal income tax return. And this means what? So in order to get a refund of your personal property tax that you paid, you must file a personal income tax return and claim that credit and attach a copy of the timely paid personal property tax receipt. So pay my car tax first, then on my income tax form, I have to do the appropriate things that you mentioned there. And at that point, I won't be waiting for a check to come back to me. I will most likely get an offset on my state income tax, which would then affect a refund if, if necessary, or the payment amount due. That's correct. Uh, so actually, the first thing you would continue to do, as you've always done, is file a personal property tax return with the county. So that's your first step, to report what vehicles you own. And then from that, the county issues you an invoice you pay your invoice to the sheriff. That money gets distributed just like it always has. Most of us go into the school. Some of us stays with the county. A little tiny piece goes to the state. Uh, then once you have paid that, when you file your income tax return for the year in which you paid it, you would then take a credit on your personal income tax return. Now, if you, if you are not required to file West Virginia personal income tax return, you are now. Uh, because that's the only way you're going to get your credit is to file that return. Uh, so in that case, you would get an actual refund check for exactly what you paid to the sheriff. Uh, if you file a personal income tax return and have tax, then it would, as you said, it would affect the balance due or my refund. So it is possible that I would get a check back if yeah. I was top-heavy with my personal property tax versus my state income tax. Yes, Yes, right. and that, that's a, it's a refundable credit. So most of the time credits are not refundable, and they are, they're available to offset your tax. But if your credits exceed your tax, you don't get the rest back. This is a refundable credit. And we've had a refundable credit for years now, probably decades. Called, they, they call it the senior citizen credit. It's actually a real estate tax credit, and it works very much the same way. Uh, for, for low-income senior citizens they can get money back from the state to help them pay their real estate tax bill. And that's always been a refundable credit where we have to attach a copy of the real estate tax bill in order to get that credit. And this is, uh, according to House Bill 2526, this is going to work the same way. That credit does not go into effect until January 1st of 2024, however. So it not only doesn't affect the tax return we're doing now, it won't affect the tax return we're doing a year from now. It'll be two years from now is when you'll start getting your personal property tax back. Okay. An another issue with the uh, income tax uh, was the the, uh, uh, the marriage penalty, and you had highlighted that a couple so times on this show, uh, uh, Ken, and I suspect you had spoken to several of the legislators. Uh, the problem that you raised had was not fixed. Uh, it was not fixed for what reason? Uh, okay, well, Craig Blair was on your show, and he said the state couldn't afford to fix it. I wrote down that quote. Um, and when I've talked to some of the other delegates and senators, they've all basically said the same thing, uh, that it, when they were, the House wanted a 50% cut, 30% now, and leading up to 50%. And the, House, and the Senate wanted 15 percent, and when they negotiated, uh, they came to 21.25 percent. And when they figured out the cost of that across the board cut, that took up all the money they had allotted for a tax cut. Uh, I, I 
think, Rob, you asked Craig how much it would cost to fix the Mary's penalty. He said it would cost $112 million a year. Uh, that seems high to me, but assuming that that's correct, uh, they did a $598 million reduction in the tax. So uh, they could have fixed the marriage penalty first and then maybe only had an 18% across the board reduction. Uh, but politicians like to do things that get headlines. So having more than a 20% cut get, catches headlines. So I'm sure that's why they did what they did. They wanted a more than 20% cut so they would make all the headlines. And if that meant not fixing the marriage penalty, yeah, we've lived with it, with it all these years. Uh, marriage penalty for most married couples in West Virginia is $1,125 a year. Uh, I'm coming up on my 47th wedding anniversary. So for 47 years, I've paid $1,125 a year more. Then my friends across the street who live together but are not married. So that's fifty grand. About fifty grand. Yeah. And do you have any idea for the average person the uh, the twenty one percent tax cut? What would that equate to? I'm trying to get back to the eleven twenty five. Yeah. If, if you go, uh, I think to page four of the source materials passed out by Professor Apple, you'll find all that information there. Yeah. So by default, not by any action that they took, but by default, by by reducing the rates across the board, it also reduces the marriage penalty. So it, it drops that pen penalty from $1,125 a year to $888 a year. Um, so basically it dropped the penalty by 21% also. So now you only have to pay $888 more per year to be married than to be single. That's a bargain. Yeah, what a deal. Yeah, I, I found that to be interesting because we were talking to Senator Rucker about the marriage um, bill with regards to uh, teenagers. And they passed a bill this year uh, that said that you had to be uh, at least 16 years old. There's some other provisions with it as well, regards to marriage. And we, we pressed on that to ask about it. It was that they, uh, part of it was they wanted to encourage marriage for people, especially in situations where you got the girlfriend pregnant, right? We don't want to discourage marriage. So I found, I found that to be interesting that we don't want to discourage it on a moral basis, but we also don't want to encourage it on a financial basis uh, because the marriage penalty clearly is a stern one in regards to what Ken just pointed out with the difference uh, between uh, 50 years, uh, 47 years of marriage is about 50 grand versus living together. So I found that to be an interesting split of uh, the approach to marriage. Another way to look at it is the numbers that Ken gave us. Uh, the, the married couple would benefit, would have benefited more from elimination of the marriage penalty than they are with the 10% tax cut. I mean the 21% tax cut. Yes. Yeah, depending on their income, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I talked to Patricia uh, shortly after she was on your show uh, and explained to her uh, – live rather than by email what the what the marriage penalty is and and she's all in in fixing it but um yeah i wasn't singling her out she just happened to be the person on the show as we were asking questions about the the, the bill that they had passed there. but i don't think she sits on the committees that come up with the tax bills correct so it just comes to the floor of the senate and uh, you know i i'll take it i'll take a 21 percent reduction in the income taxes but as I've said on here many times, if, if you think West Virginia's personal income tax law is perfect the way it is, then the way to reduce the taxes is to do an across-the-board cut. If you don't think it's perfect, which I clearly don't, then I think that's the opportunity to fix the things that are wrong with it before you start doing across-the-board cuts. But they chose to do the across-the-board cuts, so and I'll take it. In all probability, they'll continue that with the triggers they have in place. So I would anticipate the future years will continue this across-the-board cut as opposed to addressing something like the marriage penalty. Have yeah. you heard anybody explain in detail what those triggers are? I've asked the question over and over, and it's kind of a muddled, well, it's hard to explain, hard to understand. Do you know what those triggers are? Yeah, so they're all, in, they're all here in the House Bill 2526. I'm a writer. I'm not a reader, so I don't. <laughs> That's interesting. No, I'm. <laughs> he doesn't I'm kidding. his book. <laughs> uh, so I, I'll dumb it down for the triggers. Uh, basically, if by if through inflation, or from more people moving to the state and buying things, our sales tax revenue goes up enough 
that they can cut the personal income tax some more because what they're cutting the personal income tax has been replaced by higher sales tax, then that's what the provisions do. Okay. And how much will that be, Ken? Do you remember? What, how much the cut uh, will be? The sales tax, how much would it have to increase uh, for a trigger to come into place? Uh, I don't remember. Okay. Uh, and and it's not just sales tax. I'm dumbing it down. Uh, there's plenty of other taxes that go in yeah. there, too. Yeah. I think corporate net is involved in there sure. as well. And severance tax is se oh, is severance no, tax severance taken is out. Not. That was taken no. out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Eric was on uh, House Order yeah. last week or the week before and mentioned that was excluded. Or, I think Craig may have said that, too. So what these triggers do, uh, to your point, is they now handcuff the legislature into fixing anything that's in the personal income tax that would reduce personal income tax collections because if we're looking at triggers to do across the board reductions in the future you're not going to get any support for doing any other type of reduction okay. because again what makes headlines is we've reduced the income tax again all right we are here with cpa ken apple we are what uh, 22 days away from tax deadline day it's april the 18th this year for a couple different reasons but uh, ultimately uh, it is for april the 18th so the state income tax uh, cut will go from 6.5 percent this year to 5.12 percent that's going to be the top tax rate for those at 60,000 and above ken that's correct so that the top tax rate in west virginia has been six and a half percent for decades uh, and you get there pretty quick you get there at sixty thousand dollars worth of taxable income and, of course, you get there at $60,000 worth of taxable income for a single person. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you get there at $60,000 for, for a married filing joint. So that top tax rate will drop from 6.5% to 512 I was happy to see that the tax department rounded those off because when you do a 21.25% <laughs> reduction, you get a whole lot of decimal points. Uh, so they, they rounded those. And this affects all 10 stops along the way before you get to 6%. Each of those brackets has been reduced by 21 and a quarter percent, correct? Yeah, there's not 10 stops, but yes. How many are there? I think there are five. Five stops along the way. Okay, somebody said 10 the other day. I'm not sure why they said 10, but yeah. I, I remembered that part of it. All right, uh, moving right along then. Uh, so we're going to skip along here before we kind of come back in a bit more organized of a fashion because Bill Clark uh, mentioned on our Facebook page that he files for his parents so they can get their homestead tax credits uh, already, so maybe you can address that for seniors in our uh, community too. Yeah, so that is uh, that's the senior citizens tax credit that I was talking about. That's what they named it. Mm -hmm. uh, I affectionately call it the additional homestead credit, which is which is what Bill's calling it also. So if you're over age 65 in West Virginia, uh, you automatically qualify on age alone for the homestead exemption, which takes twenty thousand dollars of your assessment off of your real estate tax bill. Uh, so that's before you pay your tax bill to the county. You get 20,000 20, of your assessment you don't have to pay tax on. <clears throat> if you are a senior citizen or fully disabled and you're low income, you can get an additional, depending on, and it varies by county. Um, most people in Berkeley County, is $233 this year. Uh, so you can get an additional $233 back from the state to assist you in, in paying your real estate taxes but you have to qualify for that one on income. Is that easily findable on the state income tax form? Uh, they mail out a form to everyone who is on the homestead exemption, uh, and it has pretty good instructions on how to, to get that credit if you're not filing an income tax return. If, hypothetically, I were over 65 years old, uh, is, that, is that something that I have to file for in order to get the 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 homestead uh, tax or reduction, whatever it is we're calling it, or is, do they already know? Yes. No, you would have to file for it because they don't know how old you are. Okay. So you would have to actually go into the assessor's office uh, and give them your driver's license or some other ID uh, to prove that you're over 65 and fill out some forms, and then you will be on the homestead exemption. Once you've done it once, then you're on as long as you own that property. How can AARP know exactly how old I am when I start to be 50 years old and then the state can't know? You know, they find you if you, you, the AARP stuff just arrives. That's because the AARP is looking for money from you. 
Oh, like, but the state is go, not. <laughs> this goes the other way. Oh. Okay, this is where you get money oh, in okay. your pocket. Right. Yeah. Uh, Ken, are we taxing Social Security benefits this year? Who's we? We as in the state of West Virginia. <laughs> it depends. On. <laughs> you knew that was the answer. I certainly I did. You knew that was the answer. <laughs> the the uh, state uh, passed a uh, bill a few years back that was supposed to exclude most folks in the state from paying Social Security taxes or state income taxes on their Social Security income. Yes, they did. Uh, was it effective? Uh, well, for some people, yes. Yes. So uh, to, to understand whether you pay taxes on your Social Security benefits in West Virginia, you have to first determine whether you're paying taxes on your Social Security benefits to the IRS. So you, would ha you can't really have the discussion without talking about federal first, since West Virginia starts with your federal adjusted gross income. That's the starting point on a West Virginia income tax return. So for federal purposes, you pay taxes on some of your Social Security benefits if your Social Security benefits, together with your other income, exceed certain levels. All right? So then, if, if you don't exceed those levels, so you're not paying tax at the federal level on your Social Security benefits, then you don't pay taxes on your Social Security benefits in West Virginia, and you never have. Okay? If you are paying tax on some of your Social Security benefits for the federal level, and your federal adjusted gross income is below $100,000, then you don't pay taxes on those Social Security benefits in West Virginia. However, to the extent that you take advantage of that provision, you lose dollar for dollar your $8,000 exemption from being over age 65. So I almost have to look at everybody on their own to see what their income is, what their federal tax is, and then I can tell you whether you're paying tax on your Social Security benefits in West Virginia or not. If you're paying taxes on your Social Security benefits for federal and your adjusted gross income is over 100000 then you're paying tax on those same benefits in West Virginia. Is that a hard stop or is it phase? That's a hard stop, and it's a cliff. So if your federal adjusted gross income is 99000 and 30,000 of that is taxable social security benefits. You don't pay tax on any of those, that 30,000 in West Virginia. If your federal adjusted gross income is 101 and 30,000 of that is taxable social security benefits, you pay tax to West Virginia on the entire 30,000. I would rather a phase. <clears throat> Big fan of the phase in, Ken. Yeah. There's Bill, been, you're about to ask? I was going to say, there's been some discussion with the, uh, with the tax, automobile taxes. Uh, is there an argument to be made for paying all your taxes in up front or better for half the time? And, Ken, you can hold that answer until we come back from the commercial break. I'm in studio with the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, and the funniest man in accounting and taxes, CPA Ken Apple. Ken, great to have you here. Appreciate you uh, doing what you do. My pleasure. Yeah, and uh, including what Ken does is my taxes as well. And he's a wizard. Let me tell you something. Sometimes I'll go in there and I'm thinking, I owe ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. I'll come out with half a million dollar refunds. I don't even pay that much in taxes. That's how good this guy is. He is good. It's he's amazing good. Yeah. the credits he finds for me, the cash he rounds up. Sometimes he'll take it out of envelopes and just get, take, take, take the cash. Take the cash. Hot cash. cash Thursday. That's, <laughs> that's what he calls them. Hot cash Thursdays. Just passing out $20 bills. I hope no one from the IRS is listening. <laughs> <laughs> taking you serious. Uh, no, sir. Not at all. <clears throat> all right. So back to Bill's question. Let me. Uh, my question was: There's a, a lot of way we can pay taxes: uh, automobile tax, fire bill, uh, ambulance fee, either six months at a time or the full year. Recently on this show, I heard someone discuss that said it was advantageous, at least with the new tax re uh, the automobile personal property tax. It's best to pay it in six months, as opposed to the full year. And I did not fully understand that. Yeah, that was probably me. Okay, that said that. All right. So uh, yes, when uh, of course, speaking of antiquated tax laws, uh, you file your personal property tax return and report the vehicles that you own on July 1st of each year. And you file that shortly after July 1st. A year later, you get a tax bill. And that tax bill, they typically come out in July. And you have the option. You can pay that entire tax bill. And this is true of your real estate tax bill, too. You can pay that whole tax bill when you get it. Uh, you'll get the discount for early payment on both halves if you pay the whole tax bill uh, at once. Or you can pay half of that tax bill 
and you'll get the early credit. And then the second half of the tax bill is not due until the following February. And if you pay it before the end of February, you still get your credit for early payment. Uh, so from a, a dollars and cents point of view, it, it doesn't make any difference whether you pay the whole bill when it comes or you pay half of it and pay the other half in February. However, since it does cross over tax years, calendar years, if you're one of those people that are itemizing deductions one year and maybe not itemizing the next, uh, you can get a year and a half of real estate taxes and personal property taxes in one year. So if I know I'm going to itemize deductions next year, say 2024, but I'm not going to itemize deductions in 2023, then I only want to pay half of my tax bill when it comes in August and hold the other half until February of 2024. And then in August of 2024, I'm going to pay the full years, and I'll have paid a year and a half's worth of real estate tax and personal property taxes in 2024, and that might get me over the hump to itemize deductions. Uh, the new tax bill, uh, House Bill 2526, that passed, uh, I'm sure there'll be regulations that come out that might fix this problem, but right now it says you get a credit for timely paid personal property taxes. Well, my second half is timely paid if I pay it by February 28th. So since I'm not going to get a credit for any personal property taxes I timely pay in 2023, I'm only going to get a credit for what I timely file in 2024, then I'm only going to pay a half a year's tax this fall and I'm going to pay the other half in February of 2024 and my full years in the fall of 2024. And then on, on my 2024 personal income tax return, I'm going to claim a year and a half's worth of credits. So that's for this year. Next year, uh, future years, there would not be the same advantage? Or would there be? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, it would be a one-time deal. Yeah. And that's just a loophole in the, in the law as written, which they can probably fix with regulations if they want to. I was kept awake last night with a question that was swimming through my head, and that is, if a gambler were to hit a jackpot at a slot machine of $2,000, now stay with me, but he then goes and loses that $2,000 before he goes home, should he pay the federal and state taxes on that $2,000? Excellent question. What do you think? I would say no. I'd say it's a wash, because losses can be deducted, right? Anybody else have an opinion? Uh, he owes the taxes yeah. the way the current yeah. law is in West yeah. Virginia. It doesn't apply to me because I never win. I always lose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so trust me, that's a real-life example. It's not unusual for a gambler to hit a $2,000 jackpot and lose it all back before he goes home. Okay, that happens. Um, so the way the federal tax law is written, that $2,000 has to be reported as income. It contributes to your federal adjusted gross income, which a lot of things key off of federal adjusted gross income. Uh, you can then deduct that $2,000 in losses since you lost it all back, but only as an itemized deduction. So if your standard deduction is $26,000 and you've only got $10,000 worth of itemized deductions, you can add that $2,000 to, to the ten you already have and you're still only at twelve. dollars so you're still going to take the standard deduction. So the end result is you're paying tax on $2,000 that you don't have. So quit while you're ahead, John. Yeah. yeah. If you are itemizing deductions, if you're already at the 25000 then you can add that 2000 of losses to your itemized deductions, and it will wipe out your winnings, and you won't pay any federal income tax on it. However, in West Virginia, we don't allow itemized deductions of any kind. So you're going to pay tax on that $2,000 in West Virginia, whether you itemize on your federal return or not. How much can I win free? How much gambling wins can I have and not actually report it as income? Or is, is there such a number? Okay, so you're, you're asking a tax professional what you, what you can win and not report. The answer, well, I don't know if, I don't know the if there's like an is, exemption. The you know? answer is $1. $1. One, every dollar that you win, you have to report, okay? <laughs> Oh, since, I think, since Rob's trying to get me into trouble anyway. <laughs> He's already doing hot cash Thursdays. <laughs> All right. So so uh, I think what I me understand build off John's asking. thing, that at $600 amount, we always hear about 1099s. Uh, no, Most no. of us take that as if, well, if they didn't give me a 1099, I don't have to report the $599 I made. No, so anybody that asks me that question is asking me two questions. They're asking me, how much can I win 
before they report it to the IRS, mm -hmm. which requires me to report it. And the second question that's in there is how much can I win and not report it and get away with it? Okay. <laughs> well, it's a good way to put yeah. it. Uh, so for gambling, I don't know why we have a myriad of numbers, but the answer is it depends on what type of gambling you're doing. Okay, so if you're playing slot machines, the threshold is twelve hundred dollars. So if you hit it, if you hit a slot machine, you're playing a quarter slot machine, and you hit something for eleven hundred bucks, you can cash out your ticket, turn it into cash, and go home. Uh, no reporting. But if it's over twelve hundred, then it gets it locks up the machine. An attendant comes, gets your identification, issues you a W two G on the spot, and asks you if you want taxes withheld on it or not. So that's for a slot machines, $1,200. Uh, if you're playing a poker tournament, for instance, there's no reporting until you win more than $5,000 over your entry fee. If you're playing table games, there's no reporting until you cash chips in one transaction of more than $10,000. So it just depends on what type of gambling you're doing. Let me put uh, this out there, too. Ken did all that without notes. Yeah. yeah. By the way, it was at yeah. the top of his head. Yeah. Now, the attendant there, whoever is working in the, in the pit, they'll let you know if you've if you've gone over your limit or is that something i have to pay attention to at table as i'm games, drinking free booze and playing at the tables yeah. are you uh, talking about no, yeah. with chips no no they don't they don't keep track out well i think they do kind of keep track of how much you got in front of you because that's for comp pur purposes and, and whether or not an off duty state trooper walks off with the cash envelope in the <laughs> casino a hypothetical example to. just no, to, but, just throwing that out there. Yeah. but if john gilstrap's on a roll and he has twelve thousand dollars worth of chips in front of him at the at the blackjack table let's say and you go to the window and cash half of those chips and take the other six thousand worth home and come back in a week and cash the other six thousand they're not going to do any reporting because you didn't cash more than ten thousand dollars worth of chips right there. did you start that from the beginning again there <laughs> I, want to write that strategy. Yeah, yeah. I was like go to the window ken apple told me if i do it this way right, yeah. hey rob uh, uh part of the package that ken brings in each time are income tax myths yes and we never get to them but i read uh but i read over and there's some very interesting points here we should get to them now then okay i was going to suggest yeah. we do that yeah uh one is which big corporations do not pay their fair share of taxes okay and, and i believe that's a myth and you can agree or disagree with me uh, but what corporations do how the how corporations are capitalized is with common stock all right so most of, most of your listeners are investors in a lot of big corporations, whether they think they are or not. Just if they're in a 401k, they're an investor in a big corporation. So when that corporation makes money, it declares a dividend, and it pays that dividend out to its shareholders. That dividend is taxable. So if there is a corporate income tax, the corporation must first pay income taxes on its profit and then declare its dividend. And when its shareholders get its dividend, they pay taxes on that same profit again. So okay. I could easily make an argument that there should not be any corporate income tax. Another myth. I, I could easily make the yeah. argument that I shouldn't have to pay taxes on the dividends that a corporation pays yeah. me, right? Yeah. Because exactly. the corporation's yeah. already paid taxes sure. on it. Yes. Yeah. So, so one or the other. Uh, so if you're going to charge the corporation corporate income taxes on its profit, then the dividends that it pays out shouldn't be taxable. I don't think capital gain should be taxable by the individual investor. I have to take all the risk. If if I if I lose all my money, the best I can do is offset it with yeah. gains. But if I have gains, I can't offset that with losses more than three thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Yeah, I agree. Yep. So, and two thousand twenty-two was a perfect year to show that. Uh, so, in twenty twenty-one, I, I think virtually every tax return that I did had gains on it mm -hmm. in twenty twenty-one. And if those gains were ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars, they pay tax on the whole thing. In twenty twenty two, almost every return that I've done has losses on it. And if that loss is ten thousand, well you get to take three of it and we'll carry the other seven thousand forward. And what area of life is that fair? The odds favor the house, man. Yeah. Another Ken Apple myth is it's less expensive to live in states that have no or lower income taxes. Right. Or taxes. Yeah. No, income taxes, income yes. Taxes. So uh, so all the states need money, 
Uh, I've had this discussion several times in the last two weeks with people. That are, they're talking about retiring and selling, downsizing, and now they have an option, especially here in the Panhandle. You have plenty of options on what state you're going to live in because they're all within a stone's throw of each other. Uh, so all the states need the same amount of money to run government. It's just a matter of how they get it. Uh, some have a high personal income tax. Some have a high sales tax. Some have resources that they can tax so that they don't have to charge a high sales tax or a high income tax. Uh, so Pennsylvania is one we talked about in the last couple of weeks about moving there because they don't tax any of your retirement income. However, they told me that the, a similar house in Pennsylvania where they wanted to move to, in the county they wanted to move to, similar house in Pennsylvania to West Virginia, the real estate taxes are double. Mm -hmm. So I save the income tax on my retirement income, but I got to pay twice as much real estate tax. So just because a state has no or a low personal income tax doesn't mean it's going to be less expensive to live there. And Pennsylvania's gasoline taxes are even higher than West Virginia's, yes. or, or Maryland's for that matter, right? Yes, and some states have an 8%, 9% sales tax. So you're going to move there, and you're not going to pay income tax, but you're going to pay extra tax every time you buy something. Another one, we were talking about the marriage penalty earlier. Uh, one of your Ken Apple myths, it's always better for a married <clears throat> couple to file jointly. Yeah, so in rare occasions, that's not true. Uh, prior to the 2017 Federal Tax Act, uh, that happened more frequently. Uh, but it's still possible now to for some couples to file separately and pay less tax than they would have had they filed a joint return together. And uh, I can tell you that most of the time that has to do with medical expenses. So if I'm an elderly couple, for instance, and one of the spouses is in a nursing home, uh, and we're paying out a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year to the nursing home. That qualifies as a medical expense. Uh, well, on a joint return, you can only deduct your medical expenses to the extent they exceed seven and a half percent of your joint income. But if you file married filing separate, they're deductible by the spouse that's in the nursing home to the extent that they exceed seven and a half percent of just that spouse's income. So in that case, it could very easily save you money to file separately rather than jointly. Is that a shift you can make year to year? Without? Yes. Yeah. yes. This is a one, one caveat there, though, John. Uh, if you file separately and then you later determine it would have been better to file jointly, you can amend it into a joint return. If you file jointly and then find out later you would have saved money filing separately, you cannot amend a joint return into two separate returns. A question that many of us face at one time is, should we pay off our mortgage uh, for tax purposes? Yeah, so I hear that a lot. Like, well, I'd, I'd pay off my mortgage. I've got the money to pay off my mortgage, but if I do, I'll lose the tax deduction. Uh, that's a true statement, uh, but I haven't met anybody yet that was in a 100% tax bracket. <laughs> okay, so my question is always, would you rather pay the bank the interest and then get a little tiny piece of it back on your taxes? or not pay them the interest at all in the first place. So I think it's obvious you, you would not pay it at all in the first place. So the only, the only thing it comes down to, and you talk to Financial Phil about this, is what's the interest rate on the mortgage that I'm paying off compared to the interest rate I'm earning on the money that I'm going to use to pay it off. See, that's where we are. We get this 3% mortgage, and it seems silly, actually. It's like free money. It seems silly to pay that off because you have to liquidate other stuff in order to pay off the mortgage right so I, I think financial Phil would tell you that he could get you more than a three percent return on that money that you were going to use to pay the mortgage for off. two consecutive quarters as we just heard I would take uh, all the money uh, that you instead of paying off the mortgage take it to a slot machine see how you do <laughs> there you go because you can deduct the losses oh maybe you can't <laughs> Uh, Ken, I know there's another category called true tax stories that are always fun to go over. Okay. Yeah, so I have a few of those. Um, so I, I showed you guys a headline when I walked in that, that's an article that I printed out for this client that says, can gambling affect the cost of my health insurance? I would think no. And the answer in some cases is yes. How so? Okay. So... 
if you are getting your health insurance under the Affordable Care Act on the exchange and you qualify for a credit because you're relatively low income. I mean, you don't have to be low income, but if you're relatively low income, uh, you go on to the exchange in November of each year, and, and the first thing they ask you is how much money you're going to make next year. You give them an estimate, and they say, based on that estimate, uh, here's how much credit is available to you to buy your health insurance. So if, you, if you're a relatively young person, you might be buying a health insurance policy on the exchange that costs $500 a month. And you may qualify for a $100 credit against that based on your estimate of your income for the next year. So you pay $400 a month for your health insurance. And the year's over and you file your income tax return. And when you file your income tax return for that year, that's when you settle up. And if you actually made less money than you thought you were going to make, you'll get some extra money back on your taxes to help you pay those premiums that you paid, that $400 a month that you paid. If, however, your income is higher than what you estimated, you may have to pay back some of that credit that they gave you. Well, as I said earlier, a lot of things key off of adjusted gross income, and this is one of those things. So if you're a gambler, and let's say you had multiple $2,000 hits, and even though you left the casino without the money because you left it all back, and you had 10000 20000 I had one a couple weeks ago, $45,000 in winnings, that all contributes to your adjusted gross income, even though you don't have any of the money. And now they say, well, you made enough money that you didn't need a credit on your health insurance. you got to pay it all back. Now, if you're a senior citizen, it can work that exact same way on your Medicare premium because your Medicare premium is based on income also. Uh, you don't hear a whole lot about that uh, because for a married couple filing jointly, you don't get into paying a higher rate for Medicare insurance until you hit $192,000 worth of income. And that's determined by your income tax, filing income yes. tax? Yes, okay. absolutely. I was told by somebody who does a lot of uh, online gaming, gambling, like through some of the major ones you've heard of, like DraftKings or whatever, that they will ultimately at the end of the year give you a net result of all of your gambling so it doesn't show that you you made 110,000 but lost 80,000 you just get a net income 30,000 so that would be one way to get around the fact that you can't deduct your losses if you go through them and they just give you a net statement okay so so we have to make a, a distinction here between gambling and playing games of skill mm -hmm. all right they are treated completely differently for income tax purposes uh, so what you're talking about are games of skill, uh, which is how DraftKings and all those other uh, fantasy sports platforms, that's how they were able to do what they did without violating federal law. So they actually had a Supreme Court case that determined those were games of skill and specifically not gambling, by definition, not gambling. So gambling winnings... You cannot net your losses against gambling winnings. That's black and white. There's no question about that. There's no gray area there. Games of skill, you can. Interesting distinction. And one I was not aware of, which is the reason why CPA Ken Apple comes into this room several times a year. A font of information that we don't get anywhere else. Double font. Double font. Triple font. So when you win money gam cool when you win money gambling, they issue you a W two G mm -hmm. G standing for gambling. Okay. When you make money at a game of skill, they issue you a ten ninety nine miscellaneous for your net profits. But poker is not a game of skill. Not according to the US Supreme Court. Okay. 